Shalom, Chaverim. Hasidim tell a story that goes as following. Uh, many years ago, many of the Jewish people would live in farms and rather isolated villages, and most of them lived far away from a organized Jewish community, which basically meant that their children had no access to Jewish education. Most of these farmers were pious people, very simple, but very unlearned. And many of them couldn't even really read Hebrew themselves, much less to teach their children. So what would they do? They would uh, hire a, usually a yeshiva student, to stay with them for a couple of months. And then uh, they would pick a house that was most, most central. And all of the children of that particular village would go to this man's house. And the malamed, the teacher, would teach them how to read Hebrew and how to daven and put on tefillin and rudimentary laws of Jewish tradition. The story goes that there was one yeshuvnik, one farmer, we'll call him Beryl, who, though he was very pious and well-meaning, essentially could not read Hebrew at all. And uh, one day he received a letter. And the letter came from uh, the big city. It was addressed to him, but that much he was able to, to figure out. But when he opened up the letter, he saw it was a page written in Hebrew. So he asked the teacher of his children, can you please read me this letter? Tell me what it says. Well, um, he opened up the letter and he began reading. Dear Barrow, I have very sad news to report. Our beloved father uh, has just died. And he starts talking about the details. The teacher is reading the letter and in the background, the farmer whose father had just departed is crying and he's emotional and he begins to laboriously breathe until finally the the fellow finishes the the letter looks around and he sees how the listener the son is on the floor and he's crying now Hasidim asks a simple question who was reading the letter who saw this news first it's obvious, it it's, was the teacher. How is it that the teacher was able to read the letter, he saw the words, was able to read the letter, and there was no emotion? Whereas the fellow listening, who was removed physically from the letter, who did not see the words, as soon as he hears it, he, he fell apart. Well, obviously the answer is as follows. The person reading it was reading about a person that had died. The person hearing it was hearing how his father had died. And that's the whole difference. And that is the difference. When you read about something, but it's not personal, it doesn't mean anything to you. It's just information. Sometimes we get good information. Sometimes we get sad information. It's just information. But when you read something and it affects you deeply in your heart, profoundly, it's a different story. So Hasidim say that actually, this is the whole idea that when a person studies Torah, a person could study the Torah as if he's reading the Torah. This is interesting. This is what God thinks. This is what God says. This is what the Jewish people do. But if you're reading it only as a, as, as a stranger, you might know the information, you might be able to read the words, but it doesn't touch you. When a person studies Torah, a person studies the mystical traditions, he has to know that it's talking to him. This is my God in heaven. This is my Torah. This is my inspiration. This is God speaking to me. I bring this up because actually um, this weekend, we will be commemorating the Lubavitcher Rebbe's leadership the seventh Rebbe of Chabad. And in many ways, what the Rebbe accomplished, at least for me, was he took concepts and they, he made them personal. For example, which Jew does not know that all of us are brothers and sisters? Is there a Jew alive today who doesn't know the word Ahavat Yisrael, loving a fellow Jew? Of course we know about it. We believe it, yes. We have brothers and sisters in Israel and brothers and sisters in Russia and brothers and sisters in Morocco and brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. We have Jews all over. But it's just knowledge. And our Rebbe 
made that knowledge very personable. It's not that we have brothers and sisters. It is your brother. It is your sister. It is your cousin. And if you know that there's a fellow Jew who did not put on tefillin, if there's, you know that there's a fellow Jew who perhaps is contemplating intermarriage, God forbid. If you know of a fellow Jew that needs some help, how could you not be affected if it's your family? The Rebbe took a concept and made it real, made it personal, and consequently made it very meaningful. Another example. One of the 13 articles of faith is that the Mashiach will come, he will redeem the Jewish people, and we affirm that. Many people actually say the 13 principles of faith and say, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of Mashiach, though he may tarry, I still await him. But that's information. What the Rebbe said is, one second, this belief, this is belief for you. Do you want to live in a world of evil? Wouldn't you like to see a world of goodness? Wouldn't you feel uplifted seeing godliness? Wouldn't you want all of the pain and suffering that surrounds you to be eradicated? And then it becomes your privilege and your responsibility to do something to effectuate this change, to bring the Mashiach. Yes, our Rebbe was the type of a leader and a teacher whose genius is unsurpassed in every, in every conceivable way of defining genius. But for me, the genius was that he was able to take these, the most lofty thoughts of Torah, the most powerful ideas of Jewish ethics, and take it out of the realm of knowledge and bring it into the personal, the subjective, the immediate. Let's hope and pray that we absorb his message that love and kindness, goodness and charity will bring a spirit of purity and a spirit of change. And let us all together hope and pray that the Mashiach come very soon. Amen.